Okay, we're getting ready here. Okay. And we are live on Facebook. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the New Jersey Constitutional Republicans virtual conversation. Uh, it's my great pleasure today uh, to have once again our resident economic professor, Dr. Murray Sabrin. Doctor, thank you for joining us. Uh, great to be with you again, JR. Uh, lots to talk about uh, from now till I guess uh, we restore what the uh, Constitution said we should have, which is a limited government. Unfortunately, there was, uh, there was some uh, wording in the Constitution which allowed the legislature and the Supreme Court to expand the size and scope of government. And I think that's what uh, we have to work on, is that the, the, the Constitution means what it says about limited government. And um, the general welfare clause, I think, was one of the worst things in there because now everything is general welfare and therefore the government keeps on growing and growing and growing. Well, that's a great way to start off uh, the uh, program, Doc, uh, by talking about that. That's definitely a base hit. And you're so uh, true about the Constitution. And this is what the Re Constitutional Republicans are making a priority in reestablishing uh, re the structure of the Constitution. Yeah. Um, getting back to the getting back to the enumerated powers of the Congress, of the executive branch, the Supreme Court uh, exercising judicial review instead of judicial restraint, uh, and uh, acquiescing power to the um, uh, legislative branch, even though uh, they may the legislative branch may be making unjust law yeah. and law that uh, is not not commiserate with the spirit of the Constitution or the um, enumerated duties list in the Constitution. So you're so, so right. But uh, doctor, before we get into your great book that we've been, uh, this is part two, we're going to be discussing uh, why the Federal Reserve sucks. I want to uh, allow you to give us a special announcement of what uh, occurred this week. And I'll get that up on the screen for us. Okay, well, my new book, my latest book just came out. Uh called Universal Medical Care from Conception to End of Life, The Case for a Single-Payer System. The single-payer system, in my vision, is not the federal government, a la Bernie Sanders, but the individual or family, which historically is where medical care decisions were made and medical uh, uh, expenses were made. It was the individual, and insurance played a very small role. And I, I go over the history of uh, insurance in the United States, the history of Medicare and Medicaid, uh, employer-based insurance and uh, lay out a blueprint, a roadmap, if you will, to get back to the fundamental principle of doctor-patient relationship and needing insurance only for extraordinary expenses, not routine expenses that we pay at the doctor or for some uh, 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 test that could be done at a very low cost, uh, given how doctors around the country and companies are contracting with uh, uh, medical professionals to bring down the cost of medical care in the United States. And this is the exciting aspect of uh, the book and what I'm proposing. And hopefully uh, tens of millions of Americans will read the book and uh, a lot of them will buy it because most of the, virtually all of the uh, royalties will be going to support free market organizations and uh, nonprofit uh, health centers. Well, it's outstanding, uh, doctor, and we're certainly excited all New Jersey Constitutional Republicans are excited about this book. And next month, when we have our September um, show with you, uh, we'll begin to do a, uh, an extensive uh, analytical research into this book and discuss this book with people. And I think it's important that the Republican Party, as you know, one of the failures of the Trump administration was the fact that they couldn't get anything done with Obamacare. Yeah. Um, which has been an economic disaster for the nation. And the Republicans weren't able to give a um, alternative uh, policy um, uh, opportunity. Uh, they were not, they didn't uh, lay out a clear plan. And I think that uh, your book is going to provide a premise for which the Republican party should adopt in formulating policy as an alternative yeah. uh, to Obamacare. So this is a very, very important book. And uh, constitutional Republicans, Republicans should be uh, should be interested in getting this book. There it is on Amazon, selling for seventeen ninety five. That's a steal of a deal, and uh, 
as all good things, prices are going to go up. So you want to get this book uh, in your hands as soon as you can and start to read uh, really what should be guiding the principle of the Republican Party as an alternative to Obamacare. When you say that, uh, that that's a good uh, that's a good possibility that your book would provide, Doctor. Well, it, it really it talks about uh, the reform, if you will. Uh, I hate to use that term, but yes. the reform of the medical care system, which is a hybrid system. And as Mises wrote, Ludwig von Mises, the great Austrian economist, wrote uh, decades ago, "The middle of the road leads to socialism." That was one of his great essays in the early 1950s. And this is what we're seeing now. Obamacare is a stepping stone to a government single payer system. I think people should realize that it's being it's being done incrementally with Medicare, Medicaid, Obamacare. And the next step would be a single payer system by the government. And I'm offering the alternative mm -hmm. to that, which is a single payer where the individual and family are in charge of their medical care, their medical care decisions. And uh, that means restructuring the federal government, if you will. And of course, the argument that uh, the Democrats like to make is the fact that they think that health care should be a right. Yeah. Um, we, we see in the Declaration of Independence that among the uh, God given unalienable rights, among them being life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, I don't think they ever intended to throw health care and the right to a doctor and the right to, uh, to be subsidized for your health care. I think they believed in much more personal responsibility and accountability and taking care of yourself and mm -hmm. eating right and sleeping right and all those things that would pre preventive maintenance, if you will. So the first thing that we have to do is to do it, uh, educate the public uh, doctor on the fact that the health care isn't necessarily a right. You have the right to take care of your own body and that comes first, correct? You, you, you're spot on. In fact, I, I what we have done in this country is conflate healthcare with medical care. Healthcare is looking in the mirror. We're responsible for our healthcare. So it is our right to take care of ourselves and medical care is what we need and we pay for it just like we pay for any other service. And that's what one of the uh, things I bring out in the book is that medical care is a service, just like cable service or uh, phone service, cellular service, any uh, service that we, we pay for it comes out of our pocket because it's our choice of what to purchase or not to purchase in the marketplace. So it's a very strong free enterprise approach to organizing society, if you will. Absolutely. So let's uh, now let's get back to uh, your uh, book on uh, why the Federal Reserve sucks. Uh, I want to bring up a, a share screen to uh, show that um, uh, book with the people. Uh, this is a book that you're going to want to definitely get and uh, begin reading. Uh, it's uh, listed at $19 on Amazon today. You're definitely going to want to get this. And uh, we talked about uh, on the part one, um, essentially, uh, the responsibilities of the Fed. We talked about Greenspan and uh, Chairman Barnacki and some of the um, Apparently, in the beginning, doctor, it seemed as though these men were um, identified with a lot of the attributes of the Austrian school. But once they became chairman, they moved more towards the philosophy of John Maynard Keynes um, in, uh, in, in money and monetary policy. Would you say that's accurate? I would say basically that's true. Also, you, you've got to remember the uh, the monetarists are, are somewhat responsible for this uh, debacle that we've seen with uh, the uh, value of the U.S. dollar declining uh, steadily since 1971, 50 years ago, when Nixon closed the gold window and uh, Arthur Burns at the Federal Reserve opened up the monetary spigot to help Nixon win re-election in 1972. So the monetarists have a view that I, as a youngster, supported because I was reading Milton Friedman as a college student in his um, uh, Newsweek magazine uh, columns. And we said, well, to keep the price level stable, you just have to increase the money supply to meet the output of goods and services. Therefore, prices will be stable. And then when I became um, informed about the Austrian school, and they had a much different approach regarding money and banking, I realized that the mm -hmm. Milton Friedman approach basically gave us the Great Depression, because that's exactly what the Fed did during the 1920s. They pumped up the money supply, prices were flat, when prices in a free market, when you increase the output of goods and services, would slowly be declining, as it was throughout most of the last half of the 19th century. 
So when government intervenes, in this case, a, a government created institution, the Federal Reserve, which is privately owned, by the way, uh, you, you distort the economy, distort the price structure. And one thing that an economy needs is signals, accurate signals based upon supply and demand. And, that's, and you get that by not interfering with the economy and, la- and allowing entrepreneurs and consumers to determine what the prices should be for goods and services. So when I read Rothbard's America's Great Depression uh, more than 50, uh, well, almost 50 years ago, he criticized the, both the Keynesian and the monetarist position. And that was a real eye opener since I was an American history major. You never got that as an American history major that the Great Depression was caused by a, a, a flawed monetary policy of the 1920s. It just came about to sort of sort of a, like an, uh, an asteroid. It came and hit us and that was it without, under, mm-hmm. without understanding the underlying economic and financial reasons that you get this bubble of the 1920s in the stock market and, and real estate. And then when Hoover mm-hmm. got elected, he did everything wrong. And then when Roosevelt got elected, he just perpetuated Hoover's bad policies. So what usually happens when you get a depression that lasts a year or two, this depression lasted more than a decade. So again, it's amazing how historians and economists fail to recognize the insights of the Austrian school, which everyone should be reading. Uh, Rothbard's America's yes. Great Depression, which you can read online. What has government done to our money? All of Mises' great works on money and banking and, and credit. And uh, also Rothbard's great book of 40 years ago, The Mystery of Banking, where he gives you the historical background of fractional reserve banking. And he shows you mm-hmm. why fractional reserve banking is flawed and why it's, it's an engine of inflation. And then when you throw on mm-hmm. top of that the federal uh, central bank, you get the perfect storm of perpetual price increases and perpetual booms and bu- bo- boom and bust cycles. Right. And Mises.org is the resource that you're going to want to go to. And it's loaded with the articles, books. Uh, there's a shop there, but uh, you're definitely going to want to utilize Mises.org as a resource. And uh, doctor, let's go through... Uh, some definitions and terms. Sure. Um, sure. A lot of people hear these terms when they turn on uh, the business channel uh, or when they're reading uh, Wall Street Journal, perhaps, and some of them may not understand some of the terminology. So let's just, I'm going to give you a list, a list of terms and uh, sure. give us a, um, a definition and we'll go from there. What, what constitutes, we talked about a monetarist, a monetist, somebody right. who believes in, in Give us an exi- Give us a definition of a of a mon- monetarist. Monetarists basically believe that uh, free markets are good, so that's a plus for them. That uh, a, a lot of spending, deficit spending, is bad, which is good, which is a good I- idea. But they also believe that government has an important role to play in the monetary area, and therefore they believe that the central bank should increase the money supply roughly with the output of goods and services, the same rate and to keep prices stable. But the flaw in the monetarist approach is they don't understand capital theory that you need, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) you need prices to reflect the, the, the uh, purchases and uh, savings habits of people. So if people save a lot, interest rates will be low. And therefore, that's a signal to entrepreneurs to to build for the future because people are saving today to purchase more in the future. And so interest rates are a key component of a a sound free market economy. And the uh, monetarists and uh, other schools of thought believe that the central bank should be, quote, manipulating interest rates, which is not their function. It's, it, it, mm-hmm. it's the marketplace that determines interest rates based upon the saving habits of people. So if people don't save a lot of money, interest rates will be high and people will be spending most of their money today. And there won't be a very complex capital structure. People will be living basically at a very low level of uh, consumption and there'll be very little investment in, in the future. The, the beauty of the American right. economy for the past 200 plus years is there's been tremendous capital investment in factories, in, in, in uh, machinery, in transportation. Uh, it, was, it used to be the railroads, now the airlines, the trucking companies. And of course, the government played a role. And when they played a role, they did it badly. Whether it was canals or railroads, they distorted the, uh, the natural processes, if you will, of, uh, of, of the economy. And you got overbuilding in the 1800s. You got overbuilding in the canals. And they were, they were economic failures uh, until entrepreneurs took them over. But leaving that aside, you, you need prices to reflect supply and demand. It's that simple, JR. If prices reflect right. supply and demand, 
then you'll have an economy that will grow based upon you know, inventions, innovations, creativity, uh, and all the things that uh, human beings can do to bring goods and services to the marketplace. I mean, just look at our lifetime from the 1950s to the present, where pr products that were, were breakthroughs in the 1950s no longer exist, or even in the 80s, like fax machines. Very few people have fax machines anymore. I don't think you can even buy them anymore in, in the stores. Um, pagers, pagers were the, were the big thing uh, uh, back 30 years ago. No, one, Very few people have pagers anymore because your cell phone takes that place. Uh, the, the, what else did people have that are no longer? Uh, uh, record players. People don't have record players any, anymore. They have it on the MP3 players. Uh, you, we had these big laptop computers. Now we have a, a laptop. I'm sorry, big uh, computers. Now you have laptops because the great developments in semiconductors. So if you go through the list of all the great developments in the last 30, 40 years, it just shows you the tremendous ingenuity of human beings and that you need a monetary system that allows this to play out without distorting the economy. And the biggest distortion we've seen in the last uh, 20 years is the housing market, where government has been involved mm -hmm. in the housing market since the 1930s because of the Great Depression. And what did it give us? It gave us the, one of the biggest bubbles in U.S. history with the uh, housing bubble and bust uh, in, uh, in the early 2000s, which created a tremendous havoc across the country. So again, leave the economy alone, keep the politicians should keep their hands off and things would move along smoothly, two, three, four percent a year, uh, depending upon the new developments that take place. We don't need this boom bust cycle, which as we've seen causes tremendous pain. And then of course, add on what happened last year with the pandemic and this year, uh, the pain caused by uh, on small business and workers, uh, government, the lesson that I've learned in 50 years of studying this, more than 50 years of studying the economy and fi finance and history, mm -hmm. is that the government cannot make things better. It's only people mm -hmm. working cooperatively will increase the output of goods and services. And uh, if we do that on a global basis, then we will have what, what Mises called the international division of labor specialization. And that will provide, uh, lift people out of poverty uh, like no other policy that we could possibly have. Okay, so it's, it would be safe to say a monetarist believes in the continual printing of money with nothing in back of it. And it would be easy to say that Milton Friedman believed that, that uh, Alan Greenspan believed in it, that Ben Barnacki, George W. Bush, yeah. um, the most of the Republican Party believes in this uh, idea of being a monetarist. Now, you mentioned the word bubble. Uh, talk to us about what, a, what constitutes a bubble. Well, I think it's pretty simple. You just look at a chart of prices, and if prices are starting to rise at an accelerated rate, that means there's a huge inflow of money that's allowing people to purchase assets at higher and higher prices. And uh, that's not a normal economy. A normal economy is where prices are either flat or declining or slightly rising, depending upon the individual market conditions for that uh, sector of the economy. So uh, mm -hmm. a, a bubble is we saw that in the 1920s with the stock market. The, I think the stock market was up three, four hundred percent during the decade. We saw that in housing prices during the 1920s. And then after World War II, prices were going up, but they weren't going up at such a rapid rate. They were going up pretty slowly, one, two percent a year. Mm -hmm. And when it reached right. the three percent a year, the Fed cut back on creating money and credit. And you get mild recessions throughout the 1950s, 1960. Um, uh, a mini recession in 1966, a mild recession in 69, 70, when Nixon uh, took office in 1969, and he was deathly afraid of uh, another recession in 72. So uh, he did wage price controls um, because the United States was hemorrhaging gold to uh, France, particularly in other countries that wanted to redeem their dollars for gold at, at $35 an ounce. So because of all the monetary inflation since the end of World War II and uh, as uh, and LBJ's uh, Great Society and Vietnam expenditures, mm -hmm. um, we were running these huge deficits at the time, and uh, they were the Fed was printing money to help uh, uh, cover those deficits. And so you got right. the, the dollar getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And then uh, Nixon decided <clears throat> uh, the election is coming up in 72. So on August 15, 1971, he basically declared the United States government bankrupt and did a wage price freeze for 90 days, which... Uh, and then Arthur Burns at the Federal Reserve, his good buddy from the uh, Eisenhower administration, cranked up the money, uh, monetary spigot. 
And uh, we got a boom in 1972, which ended uh, badly with the deep recession of 73, 74, plus the first oil crisis back then. So again, the financial history, economic history are quite clear. If you intervene in the economy, you're going to create uh, bubbles. And the bubble in 73, 74 was in commodities. Uh, then we got the mm-hmm. dot-com bubble. Um, then we got the second oil crisis in the late 70s. Then we got the dot-com bubble in the uh, late 90s and uh, busted in 2000. And then we got the housing bubble. So these bubbles occur when prices go wild. I mean, prices just accelerate at an expanded rate. And the stock market, you see that in the stock market. And, and uh, there's, a, there's a good case to be made that uh, we're in a major uh, bull market. The question is, how long will it last? There's one analyst who has a very interesting chart of going back 100 years, showing that bull markets tend to last about 18 years or so. And he thinks the current Mm -hmm. bull market began in 2013, when the S&P 500 index broke the 2000 high. So he thinks the market's good for another um, uh, eight, nine years. But that doesn't mean we we won't have uh, downturns like we had in 1987, where the market declined 22% in one day. But you had this long bull market that began in 1982 and ended in 2000. So bubbles occur um, either short term, like we saw in 1987, the dot com bubble. Uh, or, and the housing bubble, where prices are just going through the roof. We, well, we're seeing it right now in housing. There are some communities where housing prices are up 20, 30 percent or more in the last year. That's not a normal economic situation. It's just an example of cheap money w- from the Fed keeping interest rates depressed when they should be a lot higher. Um, and uh, this, where money has to flow somewhere. It's like it's like water. W- water flows to where it, it can, and money yeah. flows to where people are spending it. And so it's that simple to understand right. how you get these bubbles. Right. And, and of course, a bubble needs to be inflated. Yeah. Uh, a, a real yeah. bubble, normally we think of it inflated with air, but really yeah. it's inflated with the creation of more money. What, yep. we, what we would call what we call easy money. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is what the, these bubbles are created by the this creation of money that goes into circulation and with every creation of every dollar, the dollar, the next dollar becomes more and more um, uh, invaluable. It, it loses its value. It's very simple with the baseball card analogy. If you got uh, one uh, Mickey Mantle rookie card, that's going to be worth a lot of money. But if you've got 500,000 of them, they're not going to be <laughs> worth anything. And uh, that's a great analogy. With the dollar, right? Well, um, and the analogy I like for my use. That's for my okay. Yankee. That's for my, yeah. But but the but but also um, uh, go ahead. You were going to make another point. Well, let's, you're you're in a rural part of the state down in South Jersey. Let's say you go went to the farmer and got a, a gallon of milk and it was pure milk and you paid a dollar for it, and uh, that's great. Then uh, next week you go to the farmer and he dilutes the milk with ten uh, percent water and ninety percent <laughs> milk, but he's, he's still charging you a dollar but you're only getting nine tenths of uh, milk in, in the gallon instead of the hundred percent milk. So that's an example of mm-hmm. devaluing your money by buying milk or, or diluting the, the uh, milk. And that's what exactly what the Fed does. It dilutes the value of money by creating so many, uh, so many dollars out there. And of course, the average person uh, is not an early recipient of those dollars. It's the uh, big banks mm-hmm. and uh, uh, investors and uh, the government and they're the ones that benefit from uh, the, the military industrial complex, the welfare state. And so uh, it's people on fixed incomes. It's uh, uh, blue collar workers, low income workers, middle income workers who feel the brunt of inflation. We're seeing it right now. Year to year, inflation is running over 5%. And what are we getting in the bank for our interest? Virtually zero because yeah. of the deliberate policy of the Fed to, quote, stimulate the economy, which, of course, you could... Uh, it's like a heroin. It's like a short-term fix to give you a high, and then it dissipates. Right. So they keep have to keep on pumping money in, um, and if they right. don't pump more money in, uh, that's when the economy corrects, known as a recession. And they have a name for that, uh, doctor. When they're putting the money in, or uh, creating the money, and then putting it into the economy, it's called quantitative easing. Correct? Yeah, yeah. That that's a euphemism for 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 uh making the people poor that's what that's that's what the euphemism is for i mean uh this is why what we have today is crony capitalism i mean the federal reserve was created by the bankers for the bankers 
Uh, Murray Rothbard has a great video on the history of the Federal Reserve that was done in the 1980s, yeah. which I show in my financial history class. And, and it goes through who are the people who created the Federal Reserve? What was the ideology? What was the self-interest behind it? And that's what you have to look mm -hmm. for when you look at public policy is who's going to benefit from the policies. Quite, quo bono, who's going to benefit? And that's the way you look at policy as opposed to trying to rationale whether it's a military intervention overseas or a, a social policy at home or an economic policy at home, who's going to benefit? Now, there are some people that are, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, altruists, uh, but they're not in government. The, the people, maybe Bernie Sanders is an idealist uh, altruist. He thinks that the government is a force for good. Even John McCain said mm -hmm. that about the U.S. foreign policy over, uh, overseas, that we're a force for good. Well, uh, yeah. Don't speak that to the people who've lost their lives because of uh, Korea, Vietnam, and all the other interventions in, in, in the post-war period. So the point is, Mises wrote, a gr wrote great articles about interventionism, whether it's mm -hmm. overseas interventionism or domestic interventionism. And I wish the Republican Party would take that uh, insight and run with it and point out that interventionism, both domestically and internationally, are flawed, counterproductive policies. They don't achieve their objectives. Mm -hmm. If their objective is a more peaceful world and sustainable prosperity, it just doesn't work. So there's a practical aspect to a non-interventionist government policies. And that's where the Republican Party, I think, has failed uh, politically and uh, has failed their constituents, most, many of mm -hmm. whom I believe believe in non-interventionism. And you've got to say mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't work. It's not practical when we talk about having good outcomes. And that's what we should talk about. Are the outcomes good? And we've been around a long time and we've seen government policies get uh, more expansive over the decades. And look at here it is 2021. And we're still talking about major economic and social and foreign policy debacles. Right. And the science is in, the data is in that uh, would uh, clearly indicate that uh, government intervention and intervention by the Fed um, has created um, these abnormal abnormalities in the market. And all it does is hurt the people who are in middle class people and people who are in the lower economic classes. But doctor, let's talk now about the, the little bit about the history of the, of the uh, Federal Reserve. Yeah. Uh, the creation uh, of the Federal Reserve. And of course, I believe it was in 1907 when yeah. uh, we had an economic crisis and one man came to the rescue. Jean Pierpont Morgan uh, yeah. came to uh, Theodore Roosevelt's uh, rescue and bailed out uh, the banks um, at that time. And don't you think that that provided the impetus for the progressives who created the Federal Reserve? Yeah. Uh, progressive thinking, uh, progressive thinking bankers and uh, politicians uh, like Woodrow Wilson. Uh, don't you think that provided the impetus that they didn't want to have one man have to do that anymore, that the government as a whole uh, needed to uh, provide a central bank? And of course, with the creation of the Federal Reserve, they've uh, seg segued into many different regions of the, of the Federal Reserve. I believe, how many is it? Uh, there's 17 different. Um, 12, I believe it is. Yeah, there's 12, 12 different regions. Uh, there's a yeah. Fed in New York. There's a Fed uh, in uh, Atlanta, I believe. There's another Fed in Chicago. Dallas. Yeah, Chicago, yeah. Philadelphia, Dallas. So there's, but they are all created. What's amazing as we talk about, I want you to uh, elaborate a little bit with the creation of the Fed. But what makes it so amazing is it's been very mysterious and it's uh, relatively um, been able to uh, run on its own without any sort of, uh, um, auditing. And of course, we know that our great friend, uh, Dr. Paul and Rand Paul have asked for an auditing of the Federal Reserve. So talk about a little bit about the creation and then the idea of how they're able to all uh, to uh, act, essentially act very autonomously. Are they not? Yeah. yeah. We talked about this, I think, the last time we had panics throughout the 19th century. They were called banking panics. Why banking panics? Because banks operate on the flawed model called fractional reserve banking. So they would create more money than they had gold or silver in the vaults. And that would create a little boomlet in their in their uh, region. And you had a, a major panic, the, the one that Rothbard wrote about for his dissertation at Columbia University in the 1950s, the Panic of 1819, which, of course, people can read uh, at Mises.org for free. And, uh, and throughout the 19th century, 
bankers would do this. Uh, and so what happened by 1907, when we got a major panic and uh, J.P. Morgan uh, helped bail out uh, the U.S. Treasury, the bankers decided uh, we, we, we got to get a central bank because that's going to give us the ability to coordinate the inflation throughout the country rather than banks individually inflating and getting in trouble. Let's have a nationwide coordination of inflating. And that's exactly what happened when they had their secret meeting in Jekyll mm -hmm. Island. And again, Rothbard discusses this in his video uh, about the creation of the Federal Reserve and the other collection of his essays, which you can avail which uh, listeners can read on Mises.org is a history of money and banking, which is a series of essays, which he goes into great detail of how the Federal Reserve came about. The Rockefeller interest and the Morgan interest all got together because they were rivals economically and they got together and uh, uh, their representatives had this meeting in Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. I think it was in 1910. And um, eventually that became the blueprint for the Federal Reserve that was passed by uh, Congress and Woodrow Wilson signed that in December 1913. So it's more than 100 years that the Federal Reserve has been with us. And so essentially, the bankers got their wish. They got an institution that, was, that would be able to be a lender of last resort by creating money to bail out the banks, by um, setting reserve requirements. So this way, you don't want to have too little reserve requirements because that makes the banks very shaky. Uh, and the gold would be part of the system, but it wasn't a hundred percent gold standard that Rothbard advocated. It was, it was a, mm -hmm. it was a fractional reserve gold standard. So that was mm -hmm. a flaw right there. And so, uh, right. so the federal reserve had very limited, um, uh, uh goals in its creation, uh, to be a lend of less resort to smooth out the business cycle and to preserve the purchasing power of the dollar. Well, it's failed on all three. Well, it, it didn't fail on lender of last resort because we know we they bailed out banks over the, over the decades. It certainly hasn't smoothed out the business cycle since we had a deep deep recession in uh, in uh, two thousand eight uh, with the uh, bursting of the housing bubble, and it certainly yeah. hasn't preserved the purchasing power of the dollar. The dollar has declined more than ninety five percent since it was created, but it's been on a slow path. In other words, we haven't seen fifty percent inflation in the United States in one year. Fifty percent price inflation. We've seen from 1% all the way up to what, uh, 13% in 1979, 1980. So the inflation rate has been kept in a, in a band between 1% and 13%. We haven't had any type of Venezuela type of inflation or Zimbabwe type of inflation where they're just printing up trillions and trillions of dollars and uh, you have to add, keep on adding zeros and zeros and zeros to the currency. We haven't had that, thank goodness, but we did have hyperinflation during the American Revolution with the Continentals. The, the Continental Congress printed up uh, uh, Continental money to pay uh, the soldiers. And then we had hyperinflation during uh, the Civil War where the South was printing up money to pay for uh, uh, its expenses. And so the hyperinflation has been defined by uh, several economists as when the rate of inflation hits 50% per month. So that mm -hmm. is an extraordinary rate of inflation. And of course, that means poverty for the vast majority of the people when prices are rising that fast because their incomes certainly are not rising that fast. And that's when the right. money, that's what this is called the crack up boom when prices just go wild. Uh, we saw that in Germany in 1923 where people just want to get rid of their money. You have wheelbarrows full of money. The wheelbarrow is worth more than yeah. the trillions worth of nothing. marks that were in, in, in the wheelbarrow. So again, money is one of the key weather veins of an, of an economy, that it's not only important for the exchange process and for the savings and investment process, but it also tells us how uh, policymakers are, uh, are creating money or not creating money in, in the economy. And today, uh, we're seeing uh, the effects of last year's bailout with the, uh, with the shutdown of the economy. The Fed at one time was increasing the money supply at 60% per annum. So it's not surprising that this year, because there's always a lag between money creation and prices, and now we're seeing it. The question is, how long will this uh, price inflation occur at a v much higher rate than uh, the last few years? And no one knows the answer to that. It depends on how much longer the Fed keeps on pumping money in. Uh, and so we're going to see inflation continue this year, probably into next year. And then, uh, and then it's sub subject to uh, debate as to uh, what 2023 and 2024 will look like. And so the, the, the more the economy starts to get uh, kind of weak because there's, uh, it's, the expectation is that there'll be uh, cheap money in the economy, 
uh, but they're keeping interest rates down, which is still fueling housing. But I think the housing market has cooled off the last two months because people are being priced out of the market. When prices are going up 20, 30 percent and your wages are going up two, three percent, it's very hard right. to say, hey, I have enough resources to put down a decent down payment and and uh, and pay for the mortgage, even though rates are low. Uh, you still have to carry two, three, four hundred thousand dollar mortgage, and uh, people get very, very um, uh, leery of uh, buying into a bubble. And so uh, that's what we're seeing today. I think people are starting to withdraw from the marketplace. You're probably not getting as many bidding wars as we've seen uh, a few months ago, and uh, we'll just see how this plays out. But the point is, getting back to your original uh, uh, question, is that we need an economy based upon people interacting with each, with each other in the marketplace and having money being, quote, neutral. Money supply should not be going up. It should not be going down. Whatever money, this is the point that Rothbard made when I first read this decades ago. Whatever money supply exists in society can be used optimally for spending, saving, and investment. We don't, his insight was that you don't need a, a money supply to increase to have a, a, a growing economy. That's what the monitor Tourists believe in that's what the supply side is believe in, that the that the central bank must increase the money supply, and that's a fallacy that I think Rothbard clearly uh, demolishes in his little uh, monograph. What has government done to our money? Mm -hmm. And of course, you'll hear as we have these conversations, um, terminology like soft money, easy yeah. money, meaning the printing of paper as opposed to what we believe is essential is the res restoration of hard money, um, yep. gold, silver, um, uh, money that uh, is valuable, that will always hold a value. Uh, and this has been proven through thousands of years of market activity, um, using the gold standard, if you will. That's an expression. Um, and I'd like to talk now a little bit about the fact that we did sell it or not, we're not celebrating, but we're, we know that the 50th anniversary on August 15th of Richard Nixon, um, separating, uh, paper money from gold. And of course, when people would take their gold in doctor, they would get a receipt from the bank of the gold that they brought in. And that would right. act essentially as, as the money uh, and right. the paper. So, so then they decided, Nixon decided, and this was largely because of what happened at Brenton Woods in 1944, where the United Nations got together and they decided to basically universalize the dollar because the dollar mm -hmm. was as good as gold, literally, right? Mm -hmm. It was as good right, as gold right. because that was what was behind it. So they decided on the dollar. And then um, 20 years later, the LBJ uh, administration comes in and uh, what uh, Peter Schiff, our friend, talks about is butter and war. Uh, the butter was the great society that we were spending all this money on. And then we were spending all this money on a war, uh, a, the other side of the world away. Plus, we were uh, engaged in an aggressive um, space program trying to be the first nation in the world. Um, trying to beat out the Soviets to getting into space and then getting in onto the moon. So these all these expenses, these enormous uh, deficits. And, and of course, FDR uh, also uh, created a lot of deficit, deficit and a lot of debt. But the people of the world saw that the United States were not going to be able to, uh, the dollar was going to lose its value. So they wanted to get the gold reserves. They were asking for the gold reserves for their dollars that they held in their country. France was really the leader in this. Right. Um, and they wanted to get the gold reserves. And in an attempt to protect the gold, Nixon separated the dollar from the gold. And in doing so, really the devaluation of the dollar began to occur. But this was all driven by the reckless and uh, unmitigated spending of the L Lyndon Baines Johnson administration and the democratically controlled Senate and Congress that uh, went along and, and uh, agreed with the LBJ in this. Is that an accurate uh, description of the history that brought about the ending of the gold standard? Yeah, that, that's essentially correct. I mean, uh, once LB, uh, FDR uh, started spending in order to boost the economy during the Great Depression and the Federal Reserve started creating money, 
um, like crazy during the 1930s. And of course, it didn't work because uh, at the end of the 1930s, the unemployment rate that was 19 percent and was 25 percent at the bottom of the Great Depression, in 1933. So it was a, 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 a total failure. And yet uh, historians and economists uh, laud Roosevelt for getting us out of the Depression. He did no such thing. The reason no. uh, the, the Depression ended is because of World War II, where uh, the unemployed basically became the soldiers around the world, and, and that ended the Depression, and you had a war economy, which is not exactly a, a sustainable model for prosperity when you had tremendous mm -hmm. shortages and you had the building of uh, military equipment. Uh, that's not, that's not a, an economy that is going to provide uh, uh, high living standards for the people. And so you, you had... the, the war, you, can you imagine growing up in the 1930s during the Depression and then being drafted into World War II? So 15 years of your life was spent in either poverty or fighting. And that, mm. I, I think we have a hard time wrapping our heads around a period in American history where there was so much despair. There was a lot of despair mm. during the 1930s and, uh, and 40s. And so uh, today we're seeing almost a re replay of that. Uh, we're seeing... Uh, a lot of despair because of the pandemic. I mean, uh, people are beside themselves, deathly afraid of getting sick and dying when, they, when they, we know the numbers are that if you're generally healthy and you get COVID, you're, you're gonna survive very easily. And it's people who have underlying conditions and uh, are obese and have uh, other serious illnesses that uh, they're at high risk, the elderly, particularly in the nursing homes. And then, of course, we have the, the huge military expenditures and uh, what's going on in Afghanistan now. I mean, uh, Ron Paul in his farewell address in Congress uh, predicted in, in 2011 that if we don't get out of Afghanistan, we're going to be there for another decade. And sure it is. Here it is 10 years later, and we're finally leaving Afghanistan, just like we left Vietnam, which was, which was uh, mm. not exactly a, a finest moments in American foreign policy. And so this, this is why Rothbard called it the welfare warfare state, that... Uh, or Mises would call it the, the interventionist uh, policies of, of central governments. It, it just doesn't work. I mean, the goals may sound um, uh, uh, plausible, may sound uh, uh, worthwhile, but the, the, the means are, uh, don't work. What, what works, we know, is voluntary, cooperative, peaceful relations domestically and internationally. And if you don't have that, then you're going to have tensions and conflict, as we've seen for the past uh, what, thousands of years of uh, human beings are around the world that if, uh, uh, I think Tucker Carlson the other night said it very well, there is a, a strain in human nature that if it's not controlled, you're going to lead to bad outcomes, especially if those people are in control of the government. Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot, I mean, uh, uh, mm. Kim Jong-un in North Korea. And of course, mm -hmm. uh, American presidents who think they can create, they, they can go to war without a declaration of war, which we've had since the end of World War II. Constitutional. And yeah, I mean, we've had, well, we, we're living basically, JR, as you well know, in a post constitutional America where government is not mm. restrained by the Constitution. And that is the sad reality of why one of the things I talk about in the uh, medical care book is that um, th there's no authorization for the federal government to be involved in medical care. So uh, we'll talk about that next month. And uh, that's the basic premise of, of, of the book. And then we, we, we sp I spin out the, the the other components of uh, sound medical care that would uh, be patient oriented and, uh, and not have all these big institutions dictate the medical care and procedures and, and uh, expenses and so on and so forth. But uh, right. I mean, we have an opportunity right now uh, in educating people about what the problem is and what are the solutions as opposed to just railing mm -hmm. against the federal government or state government, whatever. Let's lay out what are the problems. Okay, we want to have a strong economy. Well, how do you do that? What's the, what, 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 are the, what are the components of a strong economy? And, and that's what the Austrian school economists have done to some extent, the supply side is talking about deregulation. And, uh, mm -hmm. But the, see, the problem with the supply side is th they believe in a welfare state because they don't talk about cutting back on these social welfare programs. Right. In fact, M right. Murray Rothbard uh, spoke to Art Laffer, the father of supply side economics back in the 80s. And uh, Laffer mm -hmm. told him that um, we don't want to cut back spending. We just want to reduce tax rates. Uh, and so right. basically, the, uh, the supply side is are free market Keynesians. They believe in right. free markets, 
but they want the government to be uh, have a, a big role in the economy as well. While the Austrians say, okay, if we have an economy where people keep most of their money or all of it, as I've uh, wrote about in my book in 1995, Tax Free 2000, that would give us the strongest economy possible because then the economy would reflect what people actually want, not what the lobbyists want, not what the Republicans want, not what the de Democrats want in terms of government spending, but we'd have schools right. uh, based upon what parents want for their kids. You'd have, uh, you'd have uh, housing uh, based upon what uh, people can get together and build in their own communities. And you'd have a, a stronger transportation system as well. You wouldn't have an infrastructure problem. If things were privatized, then the owners would make sure that the capital investment would be maintained, which, which we do when you own a house. That's a capital investment when you buy a house. Therefore, you maintain the roof, you maintain the basement, you maintain the plumbing, the electrical system, the garden, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you make your own investment in, in uh, assets like a house or a car or anything, you have an incentive to keep it up. Otherwise, that, that the value of that asset will de deteriorate rapidly. So again, mm -hmm. this is just fundamental economics and finance. And I wish uh, the politicians would hear this message. And of course, uh, since they're so ide ideologically bound by the welfare state and the interventionist state, uh, they dismiss it out of hand without even uh, trying to come up with a, uh, a, a reasoned explanation why they believe in the, in, in the uh, welfare warfare state. Right. And it's interesting, too, uh, doctor, uh, in the book, um, here's the book, uh, Why the Federal Reserve Sucks. But you actually talk about the great uh, supply cider, Lawrence uh, Kudlow, who uh, I've always yeah. uh, had a lot of respect for way back in the McLaughlin group days when he was on there. He's very, very intelligent and articulate. I think uh, Donald Trump uh, understood how uh, in, uh, how intelligent uh, Larry Kudlow is. Of course, he has his own show. He's always been a uh, ardent supply sider. You also talk about the other side of the aisle, which would be Paul Krugman and uh, devout Keynesian. And uh, you mentioned him in the book and some of the statements that they have. And you also talk about uh, Mr. Joseph uh, Stiglitz, who's another very uh, intelligent economist and uh, he goes on record as saying that quantitative easing only uh, helps the stock market uh, making up the one percent and you say right here on the cover of the book that uh, uh, the federal why the federal reserve sucks is it causes inflation recession bubbles and enriches the one percent i want to talk a little bit before we conclude doc about the influences that wall street have traditionally yeah. had wall street had a lot to do with what occurred during the recession or the depression um, it really seems to be, and you bring this out in the book, that the Federal Reserve is always uh, monitoring and looking at what happens in the stock market. The stock market essentially drove um, the housing bubble along with, and I have to add this, as uh, the uh, acts like the, um, uh, the Community Reinvestment Act, yeah. um, which goes back to the 70s and providing um, uh, affordable housing. And then this was uh, escalated by Clinton and the uh, Gingrich Congress and uh, writing in the legislation, um, subprime mortgages given to mortgages given to people that had by no means could be able to afford them. Um, they're giving out easy uh, mortgages. Um, and of course, coupling that with the quantitative easing and the increase of supply of money, but we have to also remember that the our elected our elected representatives also have a responsibility uh, with uh, these bubbles and uh, the uh, recessions that we've gone through by bad by making bad policy, which created this housing bubble along with uh, ideas of uh, bundling these uh, bad mortgages and other, um, banks buying them, and then they weren't able to, uh, then of course the prices went up. Uh, they thought the prices would stay up, but then prices dropped on the house, on the home. So people were coming, uh, wanted to get their money, wanted to get their money out of the stock market. And this is what created this bubble. And <clears throat> when we look at it, we see that um, the bailouts, if you will, really created a populist movement. It really essentially mm -hmm. started the Tea Party. It Absolutely. started the reaction. It started the reaction against George Bush, and, and, and Bush would say that he believed in free markets and all the things that we believe in. But it had to be done, or the monetary system was going to collapse. But all the money went to Wall Street, and then Wall yep. Street 
takes that money and they buy back their stocks as opposed to investing companies investing in more new employment, uh, new capital expenses, uh, advertising, marketing, so forth, getting the economy going. They did it to buy back stocks, which didn't help middle class America or Main Street America. So nope. it seems as a Wall Street has been a very, very, in many ways, very the most influential um, I, entity in the economics of the United States. And when does it come to a point where the government has to just let, let the bankruptcy occur, let go through some pain? Peter Schiff talks about it. You're going to have to go through a recession to get it back again. But I just want you to elaborate a little bit on the predominance of the of Wall Street in formulating our uh, American economic policy and the reality of its effect uh, on our pockets, on our on our wallets, on middle middle yeah, America the, the, and uh, lower income America as well. Yeah, th this this is why uh, th since the beginning of the Republic, we've had a financial elite, elite in this country who've used the government to benefit themselves at the expense of the general public. I mean, uh, we saw this mm -hmm. throughout the. Uh, the, the creation of the first bank and second bank of the United States. And uh, this is why ja uh, Andrew Jackson uh, was so opposed to banking uh, as, as uh, having influence in the government. Same thing with Jefferson. They saw uh, the bankers as uh, uh, using their power at, with fractured reserves to amass great wealth at the expense of the public. And uh, these were the ultimate insider traders. I mean, they knew exactly what was going on before the average person was, and they benefited enormously. The bankers realized that they, fractured reserve banking is unsustainable. It's that simple. And therefore, you need mm -hmm. an, an institution to bail them out, which is the Federal Reserve or a central bank. And um, they understand that they know it. Uh, you know, the late Paul Volcker, who was there, who broke the back of the inflation of the late 70s and early 80s, he understood that. And um, uh, so mm -hmm. when inflation was broken to, uh, from 13 percent an annual rate to 3 percent in a couple of years, then the Federal Reserve started inflating again. And then you got the bubble that gave us the 87 crash in um, October of 1987. So he understood it and he got out and then uh, Greenspan came in and uh, he just continued the inflating policies, as did Bernanke and Janet Yellen and uh, uh, Mr. Powell, Jay Powell in, at the Federal Reserve. So th the central bankers come from the same school of thought. They think it's their responsibility to keep interest rates low so Wall Street can benefit. And uh, they don't say it publicly, uh, but uh, Green Greenspan... Uh, out of office has, has said things to that effect uh, because he now is free from the bankers in terms of uh, not being a Fed chairman anymore. So again, this this is the gr broad theme here, Jr. is crony capitalism, and mm -hmm. the Federal Reserve central banking is a, a key component of crony capitalism, as is the military-industrial complex, as is the, is the whole welfare state, and all the uh, people that benefit from this tremendous social spending. Uh, throughout the federal and government, doctor, yeah. doctor, we can also add the green energy initiatives to this oh, the, to this list. Of this, this is another example of taking an idea of uh, quote climate change and thinking that we can uh, pass laws to to impact climate. Well, the climate we know has been changing uh, f since the beginning of time, uh, so uh, right. th there's nothing new about that. But that's a topic for another day, and hopefully, you'll have uh, yes. on. Uh, that's a happer to discuss that issue. Yes, we uh, will. We will have one of the moment. most knowledgeable people in the country about it. But uh, to, getting back to your to your original uh, question of how we tie this all up is that the American people just don't know the workings of the central bank. They just don't know the, right. the, how the Federal Reserve operates. And that's why I wrote mm -hmm. the book to explain to people that uh, no matter who's in office, uh, they can continue the same policy of uh, inflating the money supply, keeping interest rates low in order to stimulate the economy, which is counterproductive. So we're all about education, and that's what these conversations are all about, try, attempting to educate the uh, people. They're not going to hear this information on the news. You may get a documentary here or there, but uh, it's been a fascinating conversation uh, about the Federal Reserve, and we'll talk about uh, e uh, economics uh, as we uh, each and every month, Doc, that we have you on. Um, as we conclude, I want to uh, put a screen up, a share screen, and I want to talk a little bit, uh, Doctor, about your uh, fine career, your fine political career. And of course, you've run for uh, various offices. You've run for governor 
uh, in New Jersey. You've run for the United States Senate. Now, if the people go to YouTube and you type in Murray Sabrin, uh, you'll see a whole list of videos. Um, here's one that he did uh, with George Mason University about the, the book and the, the topic that we've been talking about, why the Fed sucks. Um, but you'll see a whole list of videos that he's done over the years, always educating, um, always uh, being honest about uh, the economy. Here's one with uh, Lou Rockwell endorsing Mary Sabern and uh, Dr. Sabern, of course, is a great friend of uh, uh, Dr. Ron Paul, who we have a tremendous amount of respect for as constitutional Republicans, as well as his son, Rand. But you'll see a whole that you're going to watch. Here's one that we did um, with Dr. Sabern uh, called the Trump administration, the good, the bad and the ugly that we did a couple of months ago. That's uh, gotten quite a few views, especially on Facebook. But what I want to say, doctor, is that um, Republicans need, and not only Republicans, but all the citizens of the, of the state of New Jersey and of the nation, of all the states, they need to require an intellectual rigor from their representatives. And you personify that intellectual rigor, being a professor, a teacher, an educator, and you would have made a great governor and you would have made a great United States Senator. And uh, I said, even uh, after the Republican nominee for the United States Senate was decided upon a couple of years ago in 2018, when you came down to a meeting with the New Jersey Constitutional Republicans, I said that you were by far the most qualified uh, representative that we could send to Washington to represent the state of New Jersey. And uh, I will always believe that. And I believe that you would have been an outstanding governor. You would have been an outstanding, whatever it is, uh, whatever office you would have uh, wanted to, um, to take on and would have won election, you would have done an outstanding job because you're intelligent, you're a teacher, you can teach the people what is right from wrong. We're talking about what's right from wrong in, in economics with these last two discussions. We'll talk about what's right from wrong in healthcare with your new book coming out, which we're excited to do. But I just want the people to know that you've been, uh, for many, many years, you've been trying to uh, represent them and you would have provided outstanding representation to the people because you would have, number one, held the intellectual rigor that's needed for a representative. And number two, you would have defended the constitution and you hold up that hand to support the constitution you would have meant it because you understand that the constitution is the mechanism that protects the principles that are identified in the declaration of independence. That's precisely what Lincoln and the initial Republicans um, readopted in forming the Republican party. And you essentially, although you identify as a libertarian, you really are an initial Republican in your mindset, free market economies, the American system, of course, investing in um, the infrastructure of the nation, which is what was a carry on from the Whigs and Henry Clay. But you understand uh, the Republicans did have a good grasp of economics, but they essentially, more than anything, knew that the principles of the Declaration of Independence uh, were was something that we were continuing. It was an aspiration. It was something that we were continually to look for. And of course, we fulfilled that really with the winning of the Civil War and defeating of the slave power. But you would have been a great uh, representative, uh, as I wrap this up, uh, because you would have defended the Constitution and you would provide the intellectual rigor that is needed for any elected representative. And that's what we believe in as constitutional Republicans. Well, thanks, JR, for those kind words. Uh, uh, right now, uh, my goal is to get the message out about how uh, government has failed us. And unfortunately, uh, uh, Republicans have been part of the problem. Uh, in, in my lifetime, mm -hmm. Republicans had an opportunity to yeah. turn back the, uh, the New Deal, uh, the Great Society, and they haven't done it. And in fact, uh, no. they've expanded uh, uh, yes. government over the decades. And so I think what we have now is, uh, from my perspective, uh, an objective analysis of the political establishment in D.C. It, uh, uh, in 1971, when Nixon did wage price controls, uh, that's when I said there's only one party in Washington. It's called the Washington Party. And that's been... And that's mm -hmm. been borne out by events of the last 50 years. And uh, um, no question. Uh, 
that, sadly, the Republicans haven't pre, uh, done a good job in presenting a, a, an opposition to the uh, statist de Democrats. And so I think that's why I think there's a lot of work to be done in, in politics. But my goal emphasis is to educate and then uh, l l let the people des uh, decide uh, how they want to uh, inform their uh, members of uh, the legislature as to what needs to be done as opposed to just accepting what goes on in Washington, Trenton, uh, and so on and so forth around the country. Right, and uh, we're so thankful, Doctor, that you're continuing to educate. You're not formally in the classroom anymore, but you do have the classroom that's provided by social media and by this uh, medium, the New Jersey Constitution Republicans Virtual Conversations. And of course, you're with the, the legendary Tom Woods, uh, what was it two days ago? An interview you gave to him, and uh, people are going to yeah. want to look at the listen to that the interview as, as well, right? Regarding the new book. But we're yeah, so thankful we had a great that uh, you're. No, I'm, I'm yeah, doing we, some more. We, we want... I'm doing some more podcasts next week, and hopefully, uh, uh, the publisher is sending out uh, the press release to three thousand uh, venues today. So hopefully. Uh, uh, the phone will be ringing. The emails will be coming in saying we want to uh, interview about uh, a single payer system, which is diametrically opposed to uh, Bernie Sanders' vision for uh, medical care in the United States. Right. Well, doctor, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll see you next month and we'll discuss your new book and uh, really appreciate you being with me today. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you. You take care in the, in the state of New Jersey. Right. And don't forget that uh, Lincoln talked about, and you'll identify with this, Doc, is that he talked about the fact that the creation of our nation was no accident. It was it was a predetermined uh, objective and uh, given by divine providence. And he said that um, although the Constitution, the Union were very, very important and brought this great prosperity, great prosperity to the American people, there was something in back of those and it was entwined with the idea of liberty to all. And by circumstances, giving people liberty, they would be able to develop through enterprise and accomplishment on their own. So that idea of liberty to all, which all libertarians identify with, which we as constitutional Republicans identify, Lincoln uh, articulated, articulated that very, very succinctly, liberty to all and gives hope and course for all to move forward and to continue to make their lives better. Doctor, thank you so much for joining me and I'll look forward to seeing you in September. Thank you so much, you take care now. Thank you very much. Please like and share the video and thank you all for joining us, take care.